Good afternoon and welcome to this presentation of the pros and cons for the state propositions in the November 22nd general election. My name is Frances Son. I'm currently the secretary of the League of Women Voters Southwest Santa Clara Valley, which covers the cities of Los Gatos, Saratoga, Monte Sereno, Campbell, and a small segment of uh, West San Jose. The League, um, next slide please. The League of Women Voters has been empowering voters and defending democracy for over 100 years. The League has two distinct roles. It provides nonpartisan voter services and never endorses or opposes any political party or candidate. In certain instances, the League does advocate when we have studied an issue and have developed a position on it. Next slide, please. So today we're engaged in voter services and we will be presenting nonpartisan information on the pros and cons of these seven statewide propositions on the November 8th ballot. Um, this is a list of the seven propositions and please do check when you get your ballot um, for any local measures that would show up on your ballot. Next slide, please. Um, now I'd like to introduce our voter service team who will be presenting today. We'll start with Eleanor Ick, our vice president in charge of voter service. She will present the pros and cons for propositions 1, 26, and 27. Then I will cover propositions 28 and 29. And then uh, Eileen Cow, our membership director, will present propositions 30 and 31. Now, after each group of propositions, we'll pause quickly for a uh, short Q&A in case you have any questions. And for this pre presentation, we would like to acknowledge the use of some of the slides and materials that have been shared with us from the League of Women Voters California Education Fund and League of Women Voters Diablo Canyon. Next slide, please. Uh, now, just a few housekeeping reminders. Please keep yourselves muted and your video off during the presentation. If you have a question, please type it into the chat. Um, if your question is related to a specific proposition, please start your question with the proposition number. And the questions will be reviewed and selected by the presenters. We'll have about, uh, again, three minutes for Q&A after each group of the propositions. So now I would like to turn it over to Eleanor to begin the presentation on the pros and cons of the state propositions. Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, and welcome everyone to our first presentation of the pros and cons on our state ballot measures in November 2022. But before we even begin to look at the propositions, we're often asked by people, how do these measures even get on the ballot? So I thought it would be handy for us to take just a moment to review that California voters, uh, unlike some voters in other states, in addition to voting on candidates, are often asked to vote on propositions or ballot measures. Now, state propositions are ballot measures that propose new laws for the whole state, and they typically require a 50% yes vote. But then people said, well, how did those state propositions get on the ballot? And they can get on the ballot in one of two ways. They can be put on there by the state legislature, either with a majority vote, if it's just a new law, or if it's a, a proposition to amend the constitution or propose a new tax or bond, it requires a two thirds vote. Citizens can also get actively involved in our state in collecting enough signatures. You've probably met many of these people over the years, and they're asking you to sign various initiatives. If they get the required number of valid signatures, then they can qualify that petition to be put on the ballot. We also have referendums, and we have one of these on the ballot this year. It's where a citizen or an entity, after a law has been enacted, uh, they have concerns about it. So they, again, propose an initiative, and they have to get enough signatures signed by citizens. For example, if they want to overturn a law, they don't want it to be enacted. And this becomes a referendum. So the law has already been passed by the legislature, signed by the governor, but 
this group collected enough signatures to put it back on and become a state ballot measure. And then there can be local measures where you can have measures put on the ballot by your local town, city, or county that you live in. And I know here in Santa Clara County, we have a number of local measures. So we encourage you to look at your ballot carefully and look at those uh, measures there. Next slide, please. So now what are pros and cons? And this is a very general overview. They're unbiased and they're nonpartisan, an explanation of our state ballot measures. They talk about issues, they give you context or background, or we do. And there's also arguments for and against this proposition that have been submitted by supporters and opponents. And we also give you information about campaign finance, which is very important for voters to know about. Next slide. A little bit more about our pros and cons. Again, they're nonpartisan. It's important for you to understand that the arguments when we talk about supporters and opponents, they come from many sources and they're not just limited to those presented in the official voter information guide, which you all should have received by now. And most importantly, the league does not judge the merits of the arguments or even guarantee their validity. These arguments have been supported or these arguments have been submitted by people who either want you to vote for something or want you to oppose something. And so we cannot guarantee their validity. Next slide. Now, our very first proposition is one of those ones I mentioned to you coming from the state legislature. It's a proposition to amend our constitution so it had to pass with a two-thirds vote in the legislature, which it did, and it got placed on the ballot. And the question is, and I also encourage you to pay attention to some specific words as we go through these propositions. So the question is exactly, should the California Constitution be amended to expressly guarantee the right to reproductive health care freedom, including the right to choose an abortion and to choose or refuse contraceptives. Next slide. What is the situation? Currently, uh, via our privacy rights that are guaranteed in our state constitution, uh, there is a right for reproductive freedom, but it is not explicitly stated in our state constitution. This proposal wants it to be explicitly mentioned in the Constitution. And fiscal effects at this point in time, there really are none. Next slide. A little bit more background. This amendment will expressly prohibit the state from denying or interfering with an individual's reproductive freedom. It further enshrines the constitutional right to privacy and the right to equal protection. Next slide. A Little bit more background here. When the Supreme Court uh, issued their ruling in Roe versus Wade back in 1973, the US Constitution recognized a protected right to choose an abortion. And that has been the law of the land in all states since 1973. But the Supreme Court earlier this year upheld that right for many years, but with the Dobbs decision this year, that federal protection was eliminated. The Supreme Court said that rights to reproductive freedom were not guaranteed. So once this happened, citizens became concerned that other rights also might be subject to future rulings. Therefore, they wanted the California law which recognizes the right to privacy. They wanted this to explicitly, to be written more explicitly and to guarantee reproductive freedom. And it's just interesting that no state currently has a provision protecting abortion. So California would be one of the first. Next slide, please. What do supporters say? The supporters say California constitution should protect reproductive rights so that they will not be at risk in the future. That's a key point. Next slide. They say over here, the supporters 
And I do want to point out this little caveat at the bottom of the slide. It said, these are arguments submitted by advocacy groups. Their accuracy and validity cannot be guaranteed. They're trying to convince you. So the supporters say California can no longer count on the federal government to protect rights. So we need to protect our, free, our reproductive rights. They also say that these decisions should be made between a patient and their medical provider and not be based on political arguments. And lastly, they want to be sure that only in the future could state voters make a change to this amendment. Now, who are some of the supporters of Proposition 1? California Medical Association, Planned Parenthood, California Nurses, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and so on. Next slide, please. Now, what do the opponents say? They say Proposition 1 is an extreme, expensive, and pointless waste of tax money that will allow abortion at any time. Next slide. They further their argument saying, women already have the right to choose in California. We don't need this amendment. We don't need to change the constitution. And they express a concern about the, un, about the rights of the unborn fetus, especially after viability. And currently, California law does have some uh, uh, stipulations about viability. Who are some of the opponents of Proposition 1? The Republican Party of California, California Catholic Conference, Democrats for Life of America, International Faith-Based Coalition, and so on. Next slide, please. Now let's look at the campaign finance. And let's look at the top donors supporting Proposition 1, meaning these groups have donated to promote people voting in favor of this proposition. The Federated Indians of Grattan Rancheria, Newsom for California Governor 2022, that would be a PAC, California Medical Association and its affiliate entities, et cetera. Total, as of October 5th, they have raised and donated $9.7 million. Now, the donors opposing Proposition 1, there certainly have been donors donating and opposing Proposition 1, but as of October 5th, no committee had reached or had raised enough money to reach the reporting threshold. And what is that threshold? It's that only those committees that have raised a million dollars or more and have at least one contributor of $10,000 or more. So they did not meet that threshold. Next slide, please. Fiscal impact. If this proposition passed, there's really no direct fiscal impact at all because currently it's in effect in California. They do say, but if a court in the future finds that this proposition expands reproductive rights beyond the existing law, there could potentially be some fiscal effects, but we don't know that. Next slide, please. So bottom line, what does your vote mean? If you vote yes, you are voting for the California Constitution to be amended to expressly include existing rights to reproductive freedom to choose whether or not to have an abortion and whether or not to use contraceptives. If you vote no, the California Constitution would not be amended to expressly include existing rights to reproductive freedom. These rights, however, would continue to exist under the current state laws. So that's Proposition 1. Now let's move on to our next proposition, Proposition 26. And you will notice on this ballot that there are two measures that have something to do with sports betting. And you might ask yourself, why do we have two competing propositions? And the reason why actually goes back to 2018. In 2018, the Supreme Court removed the prohibition that had existed for many years against sports betting. And so since that time, many states have attempted to now implement laws that allow sports betting. In fact, 35 states have. California has attempted actually back in 2020 to pass a law, but it didn't pass at that time. In fact, I think they had to withdraw it at one point. 
So since that time, including California, states are attempting to regulate the sports betting. And this is the first proposition that we're going to consider here. And what does it do? It says it allows in-person, very important point, in-person roulette, dice games, and sports rate wagering on tribal lands. And the actual question you will be asked as a voter, should California legalize import in-person sports betting, roulette, and dice games at tribal casinos? Next slide. Again, an overview. What is the situation? Sports betting has been illegal for many, many years. Even though California allows some sports betting, but not specifically related to roulette and dice games and so on. This proposal is they want to legalize in-person sport betting. Fiscal effect, lots of money is involved. Tens of millions of dollars could be raised. Lots of money could be spent regulating. Next slide, please. Again, what would this proposition do? It legalizes in-person sports betting at American Indian casinos and four racetracks. At the racetracks, the sports betting offered only to people 21 and older. It legalizes roulette and dice games. It also creates new enforcement laws and fines for violations. It stipulates that there is to be no betting on high school sports or events with a California college team. Next slide. So again, background. Prior to 2018, there was a prohibition in the US Constitution against sports betting. California has long limited gambling in California. State law bans sport betting, roulette, and games with dice. Again, 2018 attempts to change that now. California currently allows gambling. We have the California lottery. We have card rooms. We have betting on horse races, but only at four private tracks and 29 fairs. And American Indian casino slot machines and card games. 66 casinos in 28 counties. And California's currently placed bets on sporting events with bookies or offshore companies. Many play in fantasy leagues. American Indian casinos do pay fees to the state and localities, and they benefit local communities and they do provide jobs. Next slide, please. What do the supporters say? The supporters say taxing sports betting would increase the state's revenue and will allow California's tribes to provide vital services, healthcare, housing, infrastructure, and so on. Next slide. A Little bit more detail from the supporters. It says this proposition aids American Indian self-sufficiency and community programs, does bring in money for the state, does add jobs, provides the strongest age verification safeguards, and it strengthens enforcement. And who are the supporters? Well, there are 31 California Indian tribes. There's 19 city and county Democratic Central Committees, the American Indian Chamber of Commerce, our Lieutenant Governor, and our State Treasurer. Next slide. What do the opponents say? They say gambling is addictive. Legalizing more types of gambling is bad for public health and safety. Next slide. Says it leads to more gambling addiction. Real concern about possibly putting existing card rooms in lower income communities out of business. Expands horse racing that is also harmful to horses. And a major concern creates non-union jobs with few benefits and little job security. Now, who are some of the opponents of this proposition? The Republican Party of California, Election Entertainment Group, Hawaiian Gardens Casino, Hollywood Park Casino, and so on. Next slide. Campaign financing, very interesting. Let's look over here at the top donors supporting Proposition 26. Something very unique, there's a committee that's been named Yes on 26, No on 27 and 10 California Indian tribes 
are a part of that committee and they have donated this amount of money. Federated Indians of Groton Rancheria, 31 million. Pachanga Band of Lisano Mission Indians, 27 million and so on for a grand total of $122.5 million supporting the passage of this proposition. The top donors opposing this proposition, the Hawaiian Gardens Casino, 10 million, California Commerce Club, 10 million, Park West Casinos, 4 million, for a grand total of $43.6 million. So you can see as a voter, lots of money is being spent on this proposition. And a big contrast between the amount supporting it and opposing it. Next slide, what would be the fiscal impact? It's really uncertain, but they estimate that tens of millions of dollars could be generated from racetrack and tribal casino sports betting. They do stipulate how some of that revenue could be spent. Some of it, yes, goes to an education commitment, then 70% to the general fund, 15% to gambling enforcement, and 5% to problem gaming and mental health. But on the other side, if it passes, there's certainly going to be increased state costs to regulate in-person sports betting, possibly reaching the low tens of millions of dollars. And there will be increased state costs to enforce these gambling laws. But some of those costs, of course, would come out by the out of the revenue that's generated. Next slide, please. So what does your vote mean? If you vote yes, it means that sports betting would be legal in California. Four of racetracks could offer in-person sports betting. It's very important. Tribal casinos could offer in-person sports betting, roulette, and games played with dice if permitted by the individual tribal gambling agreements with the state. Each one of these uh, casinos has to negotiate a contract with the state, and it's called an agreement uh, rather than a contract per se, which stipulates uh, all kinds of rules related to it. If you vote no on this proposition, it said sports betting would continue to be illegal in California. Tribal casinos would continue to be unable to offer roulette and games played with dice, but other forms of gambling that have been permitted in California would continue. So that's basically what your yes and no vote means. Next slide, please. Now we move on to the other proposition about sports betting. This allows online and mobile sports wagering outside tribal lands. The question itself, should California legalize online sports betting outside of Indian lands? Next slide. Overview. In California and on, on Indian lands, online sports betting is currently illegal. The proposal is to legalize this outside of Indian lands for individuals 21 and over. Fiscal effect, it could raise in the mid hundreds of millions of dollars. Also, there would be cost involved in regulation. Next slide, please. Again, an overview. This proposition legalizes mobile sports betting. It dedicates some of the revenue to homelessness, mental health, and tribal development. Licensed tribes or gambling companies could also offer online sports betting. It pays the state a share of the betting profit, but there would be a new unit to regulate online betting. Next slide, please. Background, again, the US Supreme Court ended the prohibition on sports betting in 2018. This says 20 states have legalized. Actually, that number is now up to 35. California is using initiative system to create this law. It's legal currently in California to play the lottery, to bet on a horse race, wager on card games, gamble in tribal casinos. But betting on sports events is illegal in California. Next slide, please. What do the supporters say? They say this proposition will provide hundreds of millions of dollars to support programs that alleviate homelessness, mental health, and addiction in California. 
Next slide. It says it would provide millions in state revenue to support various programs. It says sports gambling is already happening, so let's legalize it. And it will give some tribes more profits. And people supporting this proposition are Californians for Solutions to Homelessness and Mental Health support, the mayors of Fresno, Long Beach, Oakland, and Sacramento, and three major American Indian tribes and Major League Baseball. Next slide. Opponents say Proposition 27 is a deceptive measure promoted by out-of-state companies to legalize online and mobile sports gambling in California. Next slide. The opponents further clarify that this initiative was sponsored by out-of-state online gambling entities that will make millions of dollars. Money will leave the state. It's a very high fees involved and it's much harder for smaller entities to take part. And it's difficult to enforce 21 year old age limit and it's not the solution to homelessness. And the opponents of this proposition are the Democratic Party of California, the Republican Party of California, the heads of the Democratic and Republican branches of the state legislature, over 50 California Indian tribes, the California Teachers Association, et cetera. Next slide, please. Campaign finance, those supporting it have raised a total of $169.1 million as of the beginning of October. Who did it come from? Better Interactive, Crown Gaming, Bet MGM, Penn Interactive Ventures, Valleys Interactive. The top donors who are opposing Proposition 27. And please note, we have that same group back here that was supporting 26 is now opposing 27. And they have actually donated $122.5 million to oppose this proposition. The San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, the Rincon Band of Luzano Mission Indians, and so on. They have raised and are spending $213.7 million to oppose this proposition. The supporters have raised $169.1 million. A lot of money is being spent on this proposition. Next slide, please. Fiscal impact, it's really uncertain, but it's estimated that it could be in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but likely not more than 500 million annually from sports betting payments and penalties. There will be increased state costs to regulate the online sports betting, possibly reaching the mid tens of millions of dollars annually. Some of these costs, of course, would be offset by the increased revenue. Next slide, please. What does your vote mean? So what does your yes vote mean? Basically, it will mean that licensed tribes or gambling companies could offer online sports betting over the internet and mobile devices to people 21 years of age and older on non-tribal lands in California. A new state unit would be created to regulate the online sports betting. A no vote means that sports betting would continue to be illegal in California. No changes would be made to the way the state gambling laws are enforced. Next slide, please. Some people ask, well, what happens if both of them pass, which they could. They both legalize sports betting in some way. Now, if they both pass, it's possible that they both could take effect, but and more than likely, it would be a court decision. If a court finds that parts of the propositions are in conflict between 26 and 27, the one that receives the most yes votes will be the law. Thank you for listening. And now we'll turn this over to Francis, who will continue with the next two propositions. But first, are there any questions about proposition? Thank you, Eleanor. Okay, now let's talk about Proposition 28. Ooh. Prop 28 wants to provide additional funding for arts and music education in public schools. 
The question is, should California set aside some of its revenue to fund arts and music education in K-12 public schools? Next slide, please. Uh, the current situation is the state has no annual source of extra public school funding for arts and music education. And let's take a, look, a closer look at Prop 28 and its possible fiscal effects. Next slide, please. Here's some more information about this proposition. If passed, Prop 28 would require that the state provide funding specifically for arts and music education in K-12 public schools. This funding would be in addition to the funding already guaranteed to schools by Prop 98, which was passed in 1988, and would be at least 1% of the funding received by schools from Prop 98. Distribution of the funding would be based on enrollment. 70% would be allocated to schools based on number of students and 30% would be allocated to schools based on proportion of students from low income households. A school's principal would be responsible for planning how the funding would be spent. Schools with more than 500 students would be required to spend at least 80% of the funding to employ staff. Each year, local school boards would be required to certify that their schools spent the funding provided by Prop 28 on music and arts education and report publicly how that money was used. Next slide, slide please. Now a little more background. Public schools in California serve about 6 million K-12 students. Districts are under the jurisdiction of local governing boards. Roughly 60% of California public school students are from low-income families. Prop 98 passed in 1988 changed the California Constitution to require a minimum percentage of the state budget on K-12 education. There is currently no guaranteed source of annual funding specifically for arts and music education in K-12 public schools. There are some state-funded enrichment programs which may contain uh, arts and music education, such as state law requires schools to provide arts and music instruction to all students in grades one through six, and students in grades seven and eight must be offered art and music as an elective, and high school students currently must complete one year of arts or music to graduate. Next slide, please. So what do supporters say? Um, those supporting Prop 28 say that studies have shown that arts and music education improve a student's personal life and academic potential. Next slide. They also say that Prop 28 would increase funding for educational programs without raising taxes or adding any new taxes. They add that currently only about one in five public schools in California has a dedicated teacher for arts or music programs compared to some other states like New York, where over 75% of schools have designated arts or music instructors. Supporters also believe arts and music education provide skills such as computer graphics, which could lead to a variety of employment opportunities. As you can see here, the main supporters of this proposition are Californians for Arts and Music in Public Schools, California Teachers Association, and California State PTA. Next slide, please. Uh, on the opposing side, opponents say that Prop 28 will limit the state funds available for other spending. Next slide. They also say this is not the way to create a budget for schools. Requiring a set amount for music and arts education reduces the ability of the state to fund other programs that are equally important. Also, this would reduce flexibility to shift funding from schools to other programs. There are currently no uh, arguments officially submitted to the state opposing Prop 28. Two newspapers have written editorials with opposing opinions, the LA Times and the East Bay Times. They say that this is not a good time to add a requirement for use of general funds. Next slide, please. Now let's take a look at campaign finance for Prop 28. The financial support for this proposition has mainly come from Austin Butner, Fender Musical Instruments, California Teachers Association, et cetera, with a total of $9.1 million. On the opposing side, as of October 5th, no committee have raised enough money to reach the reporting threshold. Again, only those committees that have raised a million dollars or more and have at least one contributor of $10,000 or more would be listed here. Next. 
If Proposition 28 passes, the fiscal impact on state and local governments is likely to be a spending of $800 million to $1 billion each year. This is less than one half of 1% of the state's general fund. Next slide. So the bottom line, what does your vote mean? Voting yes on Prop 28 means the state will provide additional funding specifically for arts education in public schools. Voting no means funding for arts education in public schools would continue to depend on state and local budget decisions. Okay, next. So that covers Proposition 28. Next, um, we'll look at Proposition 29, which will require on-site licensed medical professional at kidney dialysis clinics and established, uh, establish other state requirements. The question here is, should outpatient dialysis clinics be required to have a physician, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant on site at all hours when patients are being treated? Next. Currently, dialysis is usually provided by licensed dialysis clinics and a patient's personal doctor must visit them once a month during treatment. We'll now take a closer look at the proposal and its fiscal effects. Next slide. Here's some details about Prop 29. If passed, this prop proposition would require at least one licensed physician, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant on site during treatment at kidney dialysis clinics. The California Department of Public Health can make an exception when there is a shortage of these practitioners, in which case telehealth must be utilized. Prop 29 also requires that clinics provide patients with a list of all physicians who have ownership interests in the clinic of 5% or more and report to the state every three months anyone having 5% or more interest in the clinic. If they fail to do so, they could be fined $100,000. The proposition requires reporting of dialysis-related infections to a state agency and mandates state approval for clinics to close or reduce services. Clinics would also have to offer the same level of care to all patients, regardless of whether the treatment is paid for by private insurance or a government funded program, such as Medi-Cal or Medicare. Next slide. Now some more background on Prop 29. About 80,000 Californians receive dialysis every month in one of 650 dialysis centers in California. This treatment is usually done three times a week and each treatment lasts four hours. Most clinics are uh, open six days a week. Nearly three quarters of these clinics are owned by two for-profit corporations, Davida Inc. and Fresenius Medical Care. The California Department of Public Health is responsible for licensing chronic dialysis clinics to operate in California using federal regulations as the basis for licensing. Currently, all chronic dialysis clinics must be licensed to receive Medicare and Medi-Cal payments. One of the current federal requirements is that a board certified medical doctor be affiliated with each dialysis center and be responsible for the quality of care, staff training, and clinic practices. Federal law also requires reports to the National Healthcare Safety Network on kidney related infections. This is the third proposition that has been supported by SEIU United Healthcare Workers West, a labor union for healthcare workers. SEIU says that workers at dialysis clinics have been attempting to unionize since 2016 and have faced some retaliation by employers. In February, 2017, SEIU began efforts to pass a 2018 proposition, Prop 8, which would have put a 15% ceiling on the profits of private operators, the dialysis industry defeated that measure with a record $111 million campaign. Again, in 2020, SEIU put 20, Prop 23 on the ballot, which would have required a physician to be on site during dialysis treatment. That pro proposition was again defeated by a 63% to 27% vote with about $121 million spent on the campaign. 85% of that by the opponents who are mainly the dialysis corporations. So this year, Prop 29 has again been introduced by SEIU, 
who continue to say they want to improve safety for patients and reduce stress on workers. Also, they want to make sure that patients and the public get more information about ownership of clinics as increasing numbers of doctors are collaborating on joint venture owners ownership, which may or may not create conflicts of interest situations. Next slide. So what do the supporters say? Supporters believe chronic dialysis clinics need to be better supervised and regulated. They say that dialysis is a potentially dangerous procedure and having a trained doctor, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant on site during patient treatment hours would assure more oversight. Next slide. Also, supporters feel that patients and the public should know who owns the clinics and will profit from treatment there. Proponents want to make sure that no one is turned away due to source of payment for services and that service for everyone is comparable. Proponents also state that dialysis companies are making windfall profits of about 18% and some of those uh, profits should be spent on improving oversight and care. Leading the campaign in support of Prop 29 is SEIU Health United Healthcare Workers West and Californians for Kidney Dialysis Patient Protection. Next slide. Those opposing Prop 29 say this proposition would take healthcare workers away from hospitals and emergency rooms, which may result in a shortage of doctors in other necessary areas of care. Next slide. Opponents also say this change could increase dialysis treatment costs by hundreds of millions of dollars every year. And as a result, they feel that nearly half of the clinics in the state might become financially unsustainable and be forced to close. They also feel that asking a doctor, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant is necessary for safety. Currently, eight states have regulations mandating staffing ratios, and there is no evidence that these staffing requirements have improved care. They say that data gathered by Medicare, which pays for most dialysis care, actually shows that California is doing better with lower infection rates than in states that have more defined staffing requirements in place. Nurses and other technicians are adequately trained to administer dialysis and respond to special needs. And the opponents uh, include, again, the two largest dialysis businesses, Davida and Fresenius Medical Care, as well as the Republican Party of California and many of the associations listed here. Next. Now let's take a look at uh, campaign finance. Um, on the supporting side, as of October 5th, no committees have raised enough money to uh, reach the threshold to be reported. On the supporting side, again, the two largest, uh, sorry, on the opposing side, the two largest dialysis business, Davida and Fresenius, they have each contributed $52.7 million and $27.3 million in uh, opposing Prop 29. Okay, next slide. The fiscal impact of Prop 29 on state and local governments is uncertain at this point. However, it is thought that if the proposition passes, clinic owners will most likely negotiate higher insurance payments to offset increased staffing costs. The budget impact on the state would likely be in the low tens of millions of dollars annually that the state would have to pay for increased dialysis treatment costs for Medi-Cal patients, as well as increased administrative responsibilities at the state level. Next slide. So bottom line, what does your vote mean? Voting yes on Prop 29 means chronic dialysis clinics would be required to have a physician, nurse practitioner, or phys physician assistant on site during all patient treatment hours and require clinics to disclose physician's ownership interests. Voting no on Prop 29 would mean chronic dialysis clinics would not be required to have a physician, nurse practitioner, or physician assistant on site during all patient treatment hours. So that concludes um, Propositions 28 and 29. We can take a few minutes if there are any questions. Uh, thank you, Francis. Now let's talk about Proposition 30. It provides funding for programs to read reduce air pollution and prevent wildfires by increasing tax on personal income over 2 million. 
So the question in front of the voter is, should California create a new tax on any individual's income of more than 2 million per year? Next slide. So Proposition 30 in a nutshell is captured here. The state collects the tax on income made in California. In 2020, the state collected over 130 billion in income tax. So the proposal would create a new tax on any individual's income of more than 2 million per year. And using this money to increase electric car usage and manage the wildfire, uh, wild, uh, wildfires. Uh, fiscal impact, uh, effects, overall revenue increase of between between 3.5 and 5 billion each year. And of course, the program management would cost the state tens of millions to the low hundreds of millions of dollars each year. Next slide. So when we take a, a, a closer look, we will see that this uh, proposition proposes an increase in income tax uh, by income tax rate by 1.75% on income over 2 million. And the rate will be 15.05 for each dollar above 2 million. This tax increase would end January 1st, 2043, if not earlier. And at least 50% of the fund collected would uh, be for ZEVs and the charging. It should, it must uh, benefit low income and the disadvantaged communities. It also requires Cal Fire to hire and train more firefighters as a top priority. This pie chart shows the allocation of funds from Proposition 30. 45% uh, uh, would go into help buying new easy, uh, ZEVs and 35% uh, will go into building more charging stations and 20% go into wildfire response and the present, uh, prevention. Next slide. So there are some uh, backgrounds here to share. California uh, actually is experiencing severe drought with increasing wildfire and the poor air quality. Most people think that drought is caused in large part by global warming and gas powered cars and the wildfire smoke are the two largest sources of greenhouse gas in the state. Both also contribute to poor air quality. Right now, state law requires California to reduce its greenhouse gas emission level to 40% below 1990 uh, level by 2030. State law also requires ride sharing companies such as Lyft and Uber to uh, have 90% of their drivers using zero emission uh, vehicle by 2030. Furthermore, a current plan was just issued by the governor on August 25th indicating that by 2035, 100% of the new vehicles sold must be ZEVs. And state recently committed 10 billion on ZEVs and two and a four, uh, two and a, uh, two to four billion on wildfire response. The cost of wildfire suppression and prevention are increasing because these fires have become more catastrophic. Next slide. So the supporter of Proposition 30 said, the greenhouse emission wildfires are all major environmental issues and we need to take action now. Next slide. So plus they also say that existing programs are insufficient to address these problems. Therefore, more fundings are required. Some of the uh, supporters of Proposition 30 are listed uh, on this table. You can see that the corporation is one of them. Next slide. 
those opposing uh, Proposition 30 says, if these issues are important, they should be paid with the state general fund, not new taxes. Next slide. They also said that California is already investing more than 50 billion on climate issues. And uh, Proposition 30 would not guarantee uh, to make ZEVs more affordable and it locks the money into special interests and none would go to education. And of course they claim Lyft is attempt to get taxpayer to help foot the bill. So the opponent of uh, Proposition 30 uh, are listed here, including Governor Gavin Newsom's PAC. Next slide. So the uh, campaign finances, here you will see the top donors to support uh, 30 and the top donors uh, to oppose the Proposition 30. A lot of money have been raised and donated to this, to this uh, proposition. And the San Francisco Chronicle reported total uh, dollar for the, for the opposing Proposition 30 now have reached $14 million. You'll see a lot of money are being put into this campaign uh, for Proposition 30. So next slide. Uh, the fiscal impact, it would generate ranging from 3.5, 3.5 to 5 billion annually. And then this revenue would increase over time. Next slide. So the bottom line is, what does it mean when you vote yes? It means the taxpayer would pay an additional tax of 1.75% on personal income above 2 million annually. And these funds would go to support ZEV programs and the wildfire response and prevention. And the no vote means no change would be made to taxes on personal income above 2 million annually. So I hope this helped you understand a little more about Proposition 30. Thank you. Next. Next, we will talk about Proposition 31. It is a referendum of on state 2020 law that would prohibit the retail sale of a certain flavored tobacco product. So the question in front of voter is, should California ban the sale of flavored tobacco products? Next. So Proposition 31 in a nutshell is captured here. The state passes a new law in 2020 the, uh, the law number is SB 793. It's banning the sale of flavored tobacco product. This new law has not gone into effect. Uh, ban the sale of flavored tobacco product by allowing the state's new law to go into effect. So again, that's SB 793. It would cost tens of millions to low hundreds of millions in lost tax revenue. And uh, enforcement would cost hundreds of thousands to low millions. So uh, next slide. Uh, here are some background uh, overview, uh, a referendum. If we take a, a closer look of this, uh, this uh, proposition, uh, it, it's a referendum as that a law uh, has already been passed and signed, be proved by voters again. And the voting yes on Proposition 31 means that you, uh, that you support SB 793, prohibit the sale of certain flavored tobacco product. And voting no uh, would mean that you want SB 793 overturned and support the sales of flavor uh, tobacco, uh, tobacco uh, product. Next slide. So here are some background uh, information. 
in August of 2020, SB 793, that's a new law, was signed into law. Uh, banning of the tobacco product, including all flavors of juices uh, and uh, methyl cigarette and such, but exclude hookah tobacco and the premium cigars. In, 200, uh, in 2009, federal law banned cigarette with non-tobacco flavored except menthol. And this year, FDA uh, proposed the banning of menthol flavored cigarette and all non-tobacco flavored cigar. State and local uh, government can actually mandate stricter uh, rules than the federal government. And right now about one third of California live in the area banning certain sales of flavored uh, product. Next slide. So the supporter of Proposition 31 say, nicotine is very addictive and the flavored tobacco could cause lifelong addiction. Next slide. Plus they say, uh, uh, Flavor the tobacco is actually a gateway to addiction among children. And in the US, more than 2 million middle and high school students use e-cigarette because they, they, many of them enjoy the flavor. And so approve of 2020 law that prohibit retail sales of some flavor of tobacco products. And four out of five young people who have used the tobacco started with a flavor of the product. On this table, you'll see some of the supporters of Proposition 31. Uh, next slide. And the opponent says, adults who choose to use a flavor of the tobacco product will no longer have a choice on what product they can buy. Next slide. Uh, they also said this new law SB 793 is unfair because it does not allow retail sales of some flavored tobacco product. Therefore, the passage would hurt small business and state will lose uh, some of the tax revenue. And since it's, if it passed, it would ban the sale and therefore it will force uh, the sale to go underground market and increase the crime. Uh, some of the opponents of uh, Proposition 31 are listed here, such as California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and such. So next slide. Uh, campaign finance for both for the uh, Proposition 31 and the opposed uh, Proposition 31, you'll see monies uh, go in, into this and uh, <clears throat> Uh, tobacco companies like RJ Reynolds Tobacco Company, of course, opposing this. Uh, next slide. So the banning of flavored tobacco would have decreased the state tobacco uh, uh, revenue up to a hundred million annually. And the size of the loss actually would depend on whether smokers continued to smoke non-flavored uh, product instead. Next slide. So the uh, bottom line is, what does it mean when you vote yes? It means SB 793 will be implemented and the in-person store and the vending machine would not be able to sell most flavor the product and the tobacco product fa uh, flavor enhancer. And uh, your no vote means SB 793 will not be implemented. Therefore, the in-person stores and vending machine could continue to sell flavored tobacco products and the enhancers. So that is uh, uh, Proposition 31. I hope it helped you understand more about it. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this concludes. So this concludes the presentation part of today's 
pros and cons. Uh, we appreciate your participation and hope that this has helped you make an educated decision to cast your vote. And uh, please visit this website on the right if you want more information or updated information. Election date is on November 8th. So please remember to vote. Thank you very much.